welcome everyone. I have to use the microphone because we're being recorded. So if we have questions, I'll repeat them. Or if you're close enough, I'll hand you the microphone. So you're all going to be on TV. So thanks so much for coming. I'm Joe Scott. I'm the director of move management for Dovetail Companies. And we're here to talk about right sizing. I don't call it downsizing. And we'll tell, talk a little bit about that. But first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Dovetail Companies. Dovetail Companies offers one point of contact for older adults for when considering a transition to a new home. We work with clients in finding uh, the right communities for them, determining whether or not they want to age in place, helping them decide if they want to go to a small condo, whatever that is. We then work with them on planning and moving, which includes right sizing, which we'll talk about today, and also uh, we are a listed, we are a listing real estate broker with the Dovetail Real Estate Group at Compass, senior real estate specialists who work with uh, older adults only. We just represent sellers, we don't represent buyers. Erin DiCarlo is the founder and president of Dovetail. Um, both her and Lauren Watts, co-owner, have years of experience in the senior industry. I'm here in this industry because 25 years ago I moved my mom into an assisted living facility in uh, Danvers. And I was about 25 years into my 35-year career in financial services. And I said at that time, when I'm 55, I'm going to retire and do something in the space. I had no idea what it was going to be because I enjoyed so much the process of transitioning her from her 40-year-old you know, home that she had been in for 40 years and then watching her thrive in a new community. I had no idea what senior move management was, but through some friends and networking, I've really been blessed to, uh, to have been doing this for the last six years. And through the process, the biggest gift we get are the amazing stories that we hear with our clients. Just hearing Nina today talk about um, how she has um, bags established for all the donations, and I didn't know that if you moved with the military and you had too many things, you get charged a, a dollar for every pound overweight. I never knew that, so thanks for that. So we love hearing those stories, so I'd love you to share those uh, with you, with me, especially as we start talking about our stuff. Again, we are certified senior advisors. We are members of the National Association of Move Managers and are certified move managers and aging at home specialists. We are realtors senior real estate specialists, part of the Compass Group. So we're the dovetail group at Compass Real Estate. So we work with planning, right-sizing and moving, and listing and selling our clients' homes. And the beauty of it is that clients can choose any one of these services. You know, clients can choose just to have us assist them with making a decision about whether or not I want to stay at home or move to a community. Or we can just help. You've made that decision, and we can just help move or we can just sell your home. It doesn't really matter as to how many of the services that you want, but they are all in conjunction. I am late. My name is Erin DiCarlo. I'm the founder and owner of Dovetail. It's great to see so many of you here today. What to do with all of your stuff uh, is kind of one of the biggest hot topics our clients face. So I'm glad to see that you're here proactively researching how to make downsizing, right-sizing for your life. So I'll take a seat in the back, and thank you for having us today. Thank you, Aaron. So as I said at the beginning, I don't like to refer to it as downsizing because I think it has a very negative connotation, and I think the process is different for every person. What's right for you may not be right for the person sitting next to you. And we've heard so much in the last few years on TV and books and online about the downsizing process. You need to take one of those and two of those and three of those. And I say that, no, you take what, number one, can fit in your space, and number two, is it safe? I'll tell you a story about uh, my godmother in her early 80s. She just recently renovated her kitchen. She decided to age at home. And we packed up her kitchen, and then I was helping her unpack the kitchen. She had four sets of measuring cups. And I said, Judy, why do you need four sets of measuring cups? She's a baker. And she said, well, if one's wet because of Crisco, and then I've used another one for milk, I need a dry cup measure for my flour. So it made perfect sense. 
And I said, okay, great. She had the room for four sets of measuring cups. Of course, they were safe, so she could keep them. But the interesting thing is, on the, the, as I left, she gave me four boxes to drop off at Savers for donation. So what was right for her is to have four sets of measuring cups and get rid of all the things that didn't really serve her. So it really is a process that is right for you. And I always say that it's a journey. We're all here because we have stuff, and that's a good thing. Sometimes it's, uh, hi, I'm Joe, and I have stuff. Because we all feel that, oh, I'm the only one that has this closet that's jam-packed or this dresser that's full of stuff that I haven't looked at in years. And you have all of that because you've lived, and I think that's a beautiful thing. And if you choose to right-size to move or you choose to right-size to just live in your current home, you're going to continue to live. So you're gonna to continue to collect things and you're gonna to have to get in a, a cycle in a way to address it. We don't want you to stop living, but stop right-sizing. You right-size and then you stop living, you stop buying sweaters, you stop doing all those things. So the good news is you have lived and will continue to live. We're gonna talk a little bit about where it all came from. Um, we all, I think, know where it came from. Sometimes there's lots of emotion attached to the origin of some of our items. Why it's still in our house, lots of reasons for that. And then, how do you even get started? That's the big question that clients always have. So as I said, we have things because we've lived. And they've come from our monumental life events, gotten married, had children, graduated, got awards at uh, our jobs, all of those things that uh, we collect along the way as a, as a uh, reflection or a remembrance uh, of them. We stay current. Good example of this is, you know, we get sick of the two pillows that are on our sofa and we go buy two more pillows. It's a good way to freshen up the room. What do we do with the two pillows that we removed? They go in a closet or they go down the basement. You're going to continue to stay current in your wardrobe. You're going to buy new sweaters. You're going to buy new blouses and shirts and golf shirts and jeans and all those things. They come from our hobbies. Over the, especially if you've been retired for a while, over the years maybe you've taken up a lot of different hobbies and tried a lot of different things. You may have skeins and skeins of yarn or blocks and blocks of wood and lathe, you know, lathes, lathes and all the things that you need to do some wood carving. You may have stained glass and glass tumblers and all of those things. And then you have the result of all that, right? You have things that you've carved or knitted or crocheted. So our hobbies tend to uh, allow us or, or, or give us the opportunity to collect lots of stuff. The store. We go to the store sometimes and we don't do very thoughtful shopping. I recently did this. And I admit it. Went, love the su uh, supermarket aisle that has all the kitchen gadgets. And I had this can opener that was really difficult to open the dog's food. And every time it was like it would dig into my hand. I saw this OXO Good Grips hand, um, can opener. I picked it up. I put it in the drawer. I left the old can opener in the drawer. Not until a few days later did I realize I didn't throw it away. I don't need it. I ended up putting it in my donation box. And it's come, our stuff has come from someone else's right-sizing efforts. Mom and Dad, do you mind if I put this in your basement to store it for a while? You know, Aunt Helen really wants you to have this desk, right? Or, you know, want you to have a collection of the china. I want you to have my wedding china. So we are collecting things either as a way of, for, you know, way of, of providing self-storage or people have given us things thinking that we wanted them. And we'll talk a little bit about how not to make that assumption when you go through that process. So where it will keep coming from, you downsize from a home you've been in for several years and you decide that you're going to move, you are still going to collect things. You're still going to have monumental life events. You're going to have birthdays and anniversaries. If you move to a new community or to a new home, so, someone's going to bring you a tchotchke every time they come to visit you, so you're going to collect that stuff, right? You're going to stay current. A year after right-sizing, you may get tired of the pillows that you just put on the sofa and get two more pillows. So you're going to still stay current. You're going to add to your wardrobe. The old blue sweater is going to get faded and have uh, pulls in it, so you're going to need a new blue sweater. 
So it doesn't mean that you stop living. It just means that you start managing your contents in a way that allows you to live in a space that's um, comfortable for you. And then finally, our hobbies. Still, you'll get stuff from, from hobbies. Um, and how do you move on from that? Do you, do you do hobbies, do you do crafts here at the Senior Center or other local um, centers that offer that opportunity so they have all the stuff and you just have to come and, and do the craft? And the store, we're still gonna go to the store. We're gonna still walk through that aisle and see those you know, can openers that we want, um, but we just have to know to get rid of the one that we don't want. Why it's still in the house? And this is really a, a question that we ask ourselves all the time. I just recently, this last summer, moved from a home that I had been in for 22 years. And I've been doing this presentation for a while, and I've always talked about, you start with something that's not emotional. And paint is something that is not emotional. And if it is emotional, I say we should be in a different room, right? So I finally, looked at my paint, because this was April of last year, we moved in August. This is a result of a Saturday afternoon. What's interesting is this navy blue was from a bathroom that I painted from the house I lived in before I moved into the one I was in 22 years. So that blue paint was 25 years old, never opened it. Painted our bathroom three times, talk about staying current, that's great. Every one of these greens is from the bathroom. I kept the other two oh, for touch-up. Well, that was two, paint, two colors ago, right? So I, I needed to practice what I preach and w attacked the paint on a Saturday afternoon and felt incredibly rewarding. So it was out of sight, out of mind, right? The, ba the, the paint was in the basement. I didn't really think about it, but I was talking about it a lot. So it finally became something that I had to address. We have things because they represent something in our life. And it could be a piece of furniture, it could be uh, some sort of collectible or collectibles, an entire collection of things. It could be a piece of clothing. It's something that means something to you. And how do you deal with getting rid of it? It could be your, your wedding gown, your uniform from the military. It could be any one of those things. So it means something to you. How do you sort of um, give it reverence and, and, and move on? Or, do you have space? Absolutely, let's keep it. You're saving it for someone. And when we go through the right-sizing process, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of emotions, there are a lot of questions to ask, and you really feel accomplished when you get done. The whole time you're doing that, you're thinking that my nephew, uh, Chris, is going to get that um, bookcase. You're so excited to give that bookcase to your nephew, Chris. You've gone through this entire process. Chris, I have this bookcase. I don't want this bookcase. And that's really, that's really defeating. So we say you have to ask people, what is it in our house that you want? I'm going to tell a story that, that Erin has told, and I think it's very poignant and, and drives this point home. Her grandmother wore plastic bangles, bracelets, and Erin was very close to her grandmother, and the sound those bracelets made when her grandmother was making her lunch or brushing her hair really were very um, soothing sounds. Her grandmother passed away, and Erin came back from college, and her father and aunt were cleaning out her, the, the grandmother's house. So she went wanting those bracelets. Dad and the aunt threw them away because they thought they weren't worth anything. So it's really important to ask what is it that you want, right? It's never too early or too late to ask that question. And you would be surprised. I'm working now in a house in Andover, Mass, that is just loaded, $1.5 million home that is loaded with beautiful, beautiful things. More Waterford and Yadros and Limoges, Chanel, Ferragamo, more things than you can imagine. The son who's running the, the clear out, because his mom had moved to assisted living, he chose the old plaster of Paris eagle that was hanging over the fireplace in the family room, a Bodum coffee press, and about six wooden hangers. That's what he chose to take. So if his mom probably and his dad who had passed probably assumed, oh, they want all of this stuff when we go. 
but it was really interesting to me. And now he lives in this big, you know, um, condo in the Seaport District in Boston. I kind of thought, like, where's that going to go in that space? But he wanted that eagle, and it was important to him. And then finally, we have no idea why it's still here. And what I like to say at this point is that I want you to go home today and stand in front of your kitchen sink, open either the right or left, or if you have a cabinet above it, and go to that top shelf and pick something up. Look at that item. You'll say, why do I still have this? Because you probably haven't touched it in years. And that's the perfect time to start your box of donations. So Nina has bags that she sets aside for specific donations. It's really a great idea to take those to get a box, put it in the corner of your kitchen or in the garage or someplace where it's, you know, you're not going to trip over. It's not going to take up space. And as you find those things, the smallest things, you know, it could be a mug, put it in that box and then drop it off at Savers. Don't sort of say, I'll get rid of that when I clean out this cabinet. So it's a good place to start is just have a box and start collecting things. And I noticed uh, when I came in that there's a uh, trolley over there that has you know, donatable items. So I'd be interested, and I'll, I'll talk to Carrie, what is, you know, what, what kind of stuff, you know, can be donated, because maybe, you know, there's a way. We, don't, we certainly don't want people bringing all their stuff in here and clogging up the, <laughs> the hall, but that may be an alternative as well. So how to get started. This is how our clients, you know, they understand where the, what they have. They understand um, that it is overwhelming. And I say, don't even try to attempt to boil the ocean because you'll be, you'll be defeated pretty quickly. And what I mean by that is walking down your basement stairs and standing there saying, I have to clear out the basement. The basement is the ocean, right? So you have to take it in small, manageable bites. We say to our clients all the time, whatever process you're going through, whether you're deciding on what you want to do in terms of your next chapter and where you're going to live, Take it a manageable bites. Don't think about all aspects at once. When you're starting to right size, take it in manageable bites. Don't try to boil the ocean and take care of every little thing you have in your house. It may be emotional, and I'll say it really is emotional. Because even if you're not leaving a long time home and you're right sizing just to get rid of all your stuff, it conjures up a lot of memories and a lot of feelings. And it will be emotional. And if you have that going into the process and that realization, you'll be far better off than not knowing it. Like being aware that it may be tough, preparing yourself for that. Support how you live now and how you think you'll live in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So think about all of those things that you have right now that serve you well, that you use, that perhaps you may not need in five years, or you may not need in a year because you've decided to move to a smaller space. So think about how you can use the things that you have now in a new space, but don't deprive yourself of the things that you have right now that you need. And asking for help, it's the biggest tip that I can give you, don't try to do it alone. And that means ask your spouse, ask your friend, ask your children, your nieces, your nephews, your neighbors, whomever, just ask for help. And I think the biggest thing that you can ask is, what do you want? Right? That's the, really one of the biggest things. And that, that helps you a tremendous amount. Um, the last time I did this presentation, a client said, there are things that are, I have a lot of emotional attachment to. But what I do is I ask my kids if they want them. And if they say no, I feel comfortable enough to donate them or throw them away. So she measured sort of, did they have, did it valid, if it validated her emotion that they wanted it, right, that validated the fact that it was an emotional piece, she felt, felt good that they would take it. If they had no attachment to it, she said, I lost my attachment to it, which I thought was really interesting. So how do you deal with it all? How do you begin, right? So we say, don't blow the ocean, take it in very manageable bites. So if you look at the time frame. So say for the next six months, I want to think about right-sizing my home. And then you're going to go April, May, June, July, et cetera, for six months. And then start listing those things that you know you have in your home that you have no emotional attachment to. Start with the paint in the basement. Start with bed linens. 
the ones that you probably haven't touched that are in back of the linen closet because you use the same two sheets, two sets of sheets all the time, right? Towels. Those kinds of things really will end up giving you great satisfaction because you'll make space in your linen closet. And there's nothing better than opening up a linen closet that looks like it's been f freed of some ancient linens. But, so bed linens is a really good, a good place to start as well. The junk drawer is also a great place. Tupperware. How, much, how many people during the pandemic when you got takeout food got it in those black plastic containers? How many have you saved? Right? Time, it's time to recycle those or see if a food pantry will want them or Meals on Wheels. It's really important to, to think about how they can be given a new life and to get rid of them. And then think about maintaining your current life. So I, this is an example of thinking about someone who's moving to an independent living community. They have a beautiful dining room set. They're not moving for another, ye another year. They love to entertain. They have table, chairs, a table that has the you know, four leaves, a buffet, a china cabinet that has the bottom and the top. They're not gonna need all of that when they move in a year, but they're gonna use it until they move. So don't deprive yourself of the things that bring you joy if you entertain a lot and want that dining room set, you keep that dining room set. Parts of that dining room set may live a new life in your home. An example of that is we say, you can take your table, but you're not taking eight chairs and any leaves, right? You're gonna use the bottom of the china cabinet as an entertainment center under a wall-mounted TV, because it's a great option for storage. And even if you think about it, you have that in your home now, and you don't have sort of an entertainment center, Think about, do I use that china cabinet? Could I use it and wall mount my television to give myself a little more storage and maybe free up, you know, free up the, uh, the dining room a little bit? And then finally, you have linens for guest beds. You have three bedrooms. You have guests come visit. You're not going to throw away all your extra sheets, right? But when it comes time to move, you're only going to take the things that you need, right? So you've enjoyed them this whole time but you've thought about what is it that I don't need? What do I need now to continue to live my life? And after I've right-sized, what am I going to need? And if you, you're staying in your home and right-sizing, you wanna think about, don't get rid of the things that you say, I know I will probably use it. Because you probably will, if you, even if you use it once a year. The, ones, the things that you say, I don't know why I have it, those are the things to get rid of. Does that make sense? Manageable bites, low emotion. Everyone go home and start with paint. So our clients often say, and, and even when we have um, new staff, because we're a move management company and work with clients in sorting and organizing and right sizing and moving, we train them to, to use the 80-20 rule. And that says that 80% of the time we use 20% of what we own, and that really pertains to everything. I think originally it originated as a, some sort of physics um, statement, but everyone has picked that up, and it really makes a lot of sense, and it's a great place to start. So as an example, Mary has all these sweaters. We take all of Mary's sweaters out of the closet, out of the guest room, out of the um, cedar chest in the basement, we take the inventory of sweaters, and it's really important to take an inventory of things. Because every time we take, if we take sweaters out of the guest room, the cedar closet in the basement, and Mary's primary bedroom closet and dresser drawers, we're making progress in every little one of, the, every one of those spaces. As opposed to going into the bedroom and saying, I'm going to deal with my sweaters, and then you go to the guest room and you still have 25 sweaters. So deal with the entire inventory of things as opposed to trying to deal with, in, with what, in his, in, excuse me, what is in your room. So Mary has 45 sweaters. We say that 20% of those sweaters is about 10. And we say, all right, Mary, pick out 10 sweaters. I'm saying 20%. Pick out 10 that you, 20% uh, of those sweaters that you feel you like. She will immediately go to the sweaters that were in the front of the closet, and the sweaters that she's worn over the last season, right? And then 
reduce the population pretty greatly by doing that and then saying, what are other ones that you really like? And that they, if Mary can't decide, we go through and pull out the ones that have, you know, that may be the wrong size, that may have pulls in and may have faded, it, or she hasn't worn at all. Mary may not be down to 20% of her original inventory. She could be down to 50%, but she still has gotten down. So it's a really good place to start. And we started that way with Bill and his golf shirts. Same example. And the thing about Bill and his golf shirts, and this happened, um, if, Bill's, if Mary went into Bill and said, get rid of your golf shirts, he would have said, Mary, I'm going to leave my golf shirts right where they are. Right? But if a third party comes and helps Bill with his golf shirts, a, a professional move manager or an organizer, or a friend or a niece or nephew or son or daughter, and works through those shirts with Bill, you find out a lot about Bill in his golf career. Right? You see that shirt that he uh, got his first hole in one. He still has that shirt from 30 years ago. Mary has heard that story so many times she's tired of it. It may be the person who's helping him, that's the very first time they've heard that story. He's paid reverence to that shirt and feels great about putting it away. And he's in control. So we do the same thing. Go through all of the shirts, all the golf shirts, pull out the ones that he wears. He's had a lot of fun at the 19th hole with burgers and beer, so there's a couple that don't fit, right? And he still has maybe five, just five and we get rid of all the others. The other ones that have, you know, if, if he golfed as part, of his, uh, as part of his job, he would have, you know, um, specific emblems on them and tell, he tells the story. And once he's told the story, he feels fine about giving them away. And Mary's not bugging him about his golf shirts anymore. This isn't the same couple, but this happened with a couple. Anyone recognize this kitchenware, false graph? 1980s, early 90s. Well, Mary had more of that than you can imagine. Talk about life events. She got it for birthdays, anniversaries, Mother's Day. And we looked in her cupboard. She had more of that stuff than I have ever seen. And I always, I go into thrift stores all the time, Salvation Army, or because I always want to buy a piece of it to show it, to have it. But the unfortunate thing is, Everything has a red X on it. That means you have to buy the entire collection that's at Salvation Army. So we're just going to be stuck with, a, stuck with a picture of it. So they had soup tureens. They had soup crocks, butter dishes, creamers, mugs, and cups and saucers. And the ugliest cups and saucers I've ever seen, they were, like little, they were little stout cups and saucers. Serving bowls, platters, just so spoon rest that wasn't even on the oven, right? Salt and pepper, everything. And we went through and said, really, how much of it do you need? It was a dead giveaway. They didn't use the, salt, the uh, spoon rest because it wasn't, in the, it wasn't on the stove. And they didn't use the butter dish because it wasn't in the refrigerator. right? So it was a dead giveaway. You don't use it. And they were fine to say, yeah, that's fine. We can donate it. Well, let's just get six of each. Let's get six plates. We went through and got the best plates. The ones that had chips or cracks in them, we disposed of. We donated everything else. And we ended up with six bowls. They got rid of the soup crocks and all those other things. And we got to the ugly cups and saucers and the mugs. And I said, let's take six of these. Let's go through them and get the ones that are cracked. And Mary said, we don't use those. We use our collection of mugs. We use mugs. Next cabinet over, it was time to right size mugs. But the thing that was interesting about that is they didn't want any of those cups and saucers or any of those false craft mugs. I heard a story about their mugs. They had a fir the first mug that they got when they were married back in like the 60s. It was this ugly orange mug. It was made of that, I say it the wrong, malamite, that, uh, yeah. They were keeping that. There were some old mugs that had, you know, they were, they were branded with certain local companies or the bank. They, mean, they meant nothing to them. But there was World's Greatest Dad. There were beautiful mugs that they bought in Italy that were, pot you know, um, pottery. Um, you know, the trip to, trip to Disney with the grandkids. So they had mugs that had a story, and that's what they used. And the thing I loved about that, we were preparing them for their move to independent living. 
And the thing that I loved about that um, is that they can have some their new neighbor in for coffee and give them a mug that allows them to tell a story so it begins a conversation, right? Because sometimes it's tough. Like, what do, you, what do you talk about with all these people you don't know? So we ended up getting rid of quite a few mugs, the ones that really didn't mean anything, but they still had plenty of mugs that would fit in their kitchen, right? So we, we look at the kitchen they're going into and say, how much space do you have, right? They had all those mugs the same way Judy had four sets of measuring cups, right? So it was enough, they had the space because they didn't have all the other, you know, ugly mugs and cups and saucers that uh, went with the false craft. So they donated a lot of mugs. We threw away some mugs, and um, we put the rest back in the cabinet for us to eventually come back and pack up. You can request our right-sizing guide. I'll give you the email address at the end. And in it is included a worksheet where you can start coming up with your own plan. What is your timeline? April, May, June, July, etc. Starting with those belongings that have no emotional value, ending with those that do. And those that do are books, photographs, memorabilia, your collectibles. Can you imagine if you started with those right here, you would go down a hole and feel so defeated that you wouldn't want to move on. You get rid of all that stuff that doesn't mean anything, and you see a, a, an emptier basement and a, a junk drawer that's free of less free of some junk. We're still going to have junk. Tupperware is gone. We have more space that motivates you to keep going. And I always say to clients, books is they, those are probably the most difficult, especially if you are a voracious reader or a collector of antique books. And I always say, take books 1.0. Take your first pass at books a few months into the process and get rid of the books that you have not looked at. There are so many great, let's talk about donation sources, but there are so many ways to get rid of books. That's getting rid of atlases and reference books, encyclopedias, things that you're not going to use. Cookbooks, we, how many cookbooks do, do, do a lot of us have that we really never, then never open? Get rid of those books. Then you have all that great... Um, fiction and nonfiction. We have a client who's sorting through her books and she has them all by genre. Um, you know, war fiction, war nonfiction, biographies, autobiographies, celebrities. She had everything, but that worked for her. And then she's going to go through each one of the genres as opposed to going through the entire collection. And in the process, you get, in that first pass, you're going to get rid of some books. Because if you started with books way over here, to, Killing Mo to Kill a Mockingbird is my favorite book. And if I like picked up To Kill a Mockingbird, I'd go to that page where the court scene starts. You sit down, you start reading it, and you're done, right? So don't, that doesn't mean you can't do that here. Don't let it derail you at the beginning. Photographs are another one of those things too. We say all the time, you can digitize photographs, but then I say you can also take out a second mortgage on your home or take a mortgage out on your home because it's very expensive. It's very convenient, but it's expensive. So if you look at all the photographs that you may have at home in those old photo albums, the amount of space that those photo albums take up is pretty amazing for the amount of photos that are actually in them. So we suggest all the time that folks go through and take all those photos out and then put them in a photo box. You can buy a photo box on Amazon has them, Michael's Crafts has them. I don't know as to if they do that much in terms of helping with fading and all of that. I've used to use the, the Sterilite um, shoe box size. The amount of photographs that can fit in one of those is amazing. And you think about, you still have the photographs, you just don't have all of those thick photo albums. A client who had so many carousels of slides didn't know what to do with them, but it was a really great opportunity for him and his kids to go through the slides, and they took a photo with their phone. phone smartphones and the internet are the best thing that ever happened to right-sizing because it helps so much. They took a picture of the slides that they wanted and then printed those out. So they had a photograph of the slide that was projected.
And it was also a great opportunity to give reverence to them, to talk about the trip, to talk about the experience, and then end up with maybe a few photos that came from, you know, six carousels of, of slides. So start again. Again, start with non-emotional. Move then to what is uh, something that will invoke a lot of emotion. So if you've done that, and you apply the 80-20 rule, and you start with paint, junk drawer, kitchen pantry. Junk drawer, I always refer to the, the nightstand drawer as the junk drawer of the second floor, because it's always, you know, anything that ends up on the top of the nightstand ends up in the drawer at some point. Plasticware, pots and pans, and pots and pans, I, when I, like I said, I moved, I'm a cook and I have a lot of pots and pans. I have far less now. But I had pots and pans in the basement, in the kitchen, and in the mudroom closet. I put them all out in the kitchen island and picked out the ones that I wanted. Again, if like Mary's sweaters, I dealt with that inventory, donated a lot, but in the process, I reduced some of the inventory of stuff in the basement, some in the mudroom, and some in the kitchen. Again, if you go into the kitchen and say, where do I start? You're overwhelmed. So start with the uninventory of items. So if you do that, some, of in, some inventories, if you follow the 80-20 rule, you can really reduce the inventory of some of the things that you have. Even if you, it's not 80%, you can get down to, even if it's 50% of what you have. And then when you're in a right-sizing cycle, so every six months you decide you're gonna do it, or every year, you start again at the beginning. You start again with those things that you may have collected over the last six months or a year that have no, you have no emotional attachment to and start getting rid of those. So you go through and you do it once. As you continue to do it, always start with the stuff that doesn't mean much. There are some harsh realities in this right-sizing process. And the first is that family and friends do not want anything that you have. They don't want your furniture, your china, your silver, your hummels, your yadros. They don't want any of it. Your Balik, your Lennox vases, they don't want any of it. However, it's really good to ask, and that's why you say you never know what someone does want. Remember Aaron's grandma's bracelets. There may be items for sale but you may think that you have a lot of things that could be sold. And it's disappointing that there's not a market for a lot of things. And if there is a market for things, sale price falls far below expectation. And we always suggest that if you think you have something that's worth selling, and it, it could be a painting, a piece of jewelry, whatever it is, make sure that you get it appraised prior to selling it to make sure that you know what the open market will, will uh, support. When I said iPhones or smartphones are one of the best things that ever happened to us, you can go on the internet and find the item. If you go on Google and you hit the camera, it will pull up all the similar items and you'll find out where they're being sold, whether it's on Etsy or eBay or another secondhand or consignment site, and you'll see what the value is. So that prompts you then to sort of say, maybe mine is worth the same thing. Brown furniture, yeah. So I have some brown furniture that I, I, I actually like brown furniture, but now people buy the stuff that's gonna last five years. How many people still have the original bedroom set they bought when they moved into their homes, yeah? And it probably still is in really good shape because they were built like they could survive a tornado. Yeah, yeah, Nina has her grandmothers. Kids now, <laughs> sound like my mother, kids now, but nowadays kids don't want that stuff. They want to go to Ikea, they want to go to Target, they want to get the latest and greatest, and to, they want to stay current far more than we wanted to stay, or you wanted to stay current. So they stay current every five years, and they get rid of that fall of particle board um, dresser and they go by the next best thing. However, there is a new life for brown furniture, if you have some that you want to get rid of. 
We work with an organization called Household Goods in Acton, Massachusetts. And it was started by a gentleman who's now in his mid-90s, he and his wife. When he retired from Raytheon, I don't know, 35 years ago, he started collecting things for um, those in need at his church. He has since built this amazing organization that serves underprivileged families. We, uh, it's, and it's all run by about 900 volunteers. We were there last winter, and it was at the time when they were serving families from Afghanistan. And to watch a family come in in a section of this huge warehouse that had all these kitchen and dining room tables, to, so, to see that they could come in and sit down and sort of try it out and be happy that they had a dining room table, go to the bedroom section and pick out a, bed, a brown dresser and a brown chest of drawers. So I say a brown dresser is better than no dresser. So things are given a new life and people do, there's so many people that need them. So to think about donation, it's really an important part of how you deal with getting rid of some of your things. So things are get best given a new purpose. And there's so many different resources that we'll talk about, um, but there are, there are organizations that take textiles for um, recycling, uh, organizations like Household Goods, where you can, you know, they can find a new life with a family that needs them. So to talk about what to do and sort of what are some of the resources that you can use to help you in the process. And a lot of it you can do yourself. There are professional move managers and organizers. A third party is really helpful because they have an extensive uh, network of vendors, inc you know, including appraisers and appraisers for very specific things. Same with um, or, or, uh, professional organizers as well. Appraisers, if you have things that you think are of value, appraiser is your best friend. Um, and if you choose to find an appraiser, make sure that they're certified appraisers. The best place to get an appraiser is from your estate attorney because they probably have used qualified appraisers to value estates. So it's a good place to ask. Auctioneers. So there are auction houses who will come in and buy entire contents of a home. If you're just going through the right sizing effort just to, to uh, and you're going to stay in your current home, you probably are not going to want an auctioneer. But if you have an entire estate of things, an auctioneer is a good place to start. However, I often caution people, know the value of what it is the auctioneer is going to take before you accept a price for the entire lot of uh, furniture and collectibles and dishware and silverware and all of that. Estate sales are also great options. Um, that's where estate sales are staged in your home. Estate sale companies work to um, get it online and advertise it and manage it on site. The thing that is great about estate sale uh, companies is that they don't release the address of the estate sale until the morning of the estate sale. So they, it, it, it eliminates people coming by whenever they want. But the thing that's great about the estate sales is that you do, you get a lot of people who have specific interest in things. They'll see photographs online and it's managed by someone else and you get a portion of that of the proceeds. Um, consignment. So there's both consignment stores and online consignment resources. Um, we work with a, a company called Furniture Consignment Gallery. They're in Burlington, Hanover, Natick, and they take a lot of beautiful furniture and we'll put it on consignment and it's a 70-30 split. 70% 70 of the proceeds go to the client, 30% go to furniture, uh, furniture consignment gallery. But there are small local consignment stores that will take vintage jewelry, men's, women's clothing, sport, sporting items, golf clubs. So there's so many different options. So it's really great to find out what's in our, you know, your local area uh, and put some of those things on consignment. It can be a, 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 a quite a task to manage. So you bring a bag of you know, clothes that can be given a new life, you're then tracking how much did I get for that dress? How much did I get for that sweater? How much did I get for that suit? Sometimes it's not worth the effort from what you end up getting from it. So it's sometimes better to um, just donate it. We do work with an organization called The Real Real. 
Um, it's an online uh, consignment store. We work directly with their estates and, and uh, trust division, and they come to a client's home and go through all the things that have value, but they will only do the highest end, you know, Ferragamo and Chanel and all of that. Um, clients are often disappointed that they won't buy the Waterford and Lenox China, um, but that's an option if you have a high-end, if collection of high-end items. Um, but there are also options, other consignment options, I think Poshmark is one and there's some others, that take, you know, um, regular sort of run-of-the-mill um, items uh, and, and they come in, take care of them, you know, they take them and you don't have to worry and you can monitor online, you know, what they're getting. There are online auctions. Um, a couple of them are Auction Ninja and Max Sold. We use, uh, partner with, we partner with Max Sold. And what Max Sold does is they come into the home, um, it's a $900 fee, and they take photos of all the items that are gonna be online for display. They list them all at a dollar, and you'd be surprised what each of them get. You may get, someone may get $25 for a sectional sofa. It's gonna cost them $500 for someone to pick it up and donate it. So you're better off as someone to pay you 50 bucks for a sofa than having to pay to get rid of it. So Max Hold is a really great option if you have a, a, enough stuff um, and they're a really great organization and do a great job online of promoting um, the, the, their, their auctions. We had an auction um, in Dorchester and the day of the pickup, there were, gosh, um, more pickup trucks and U-Hauls and trailers than you can imagine because collectors or people who sell those at flea markets or resale are watching those auctions. So they do end up bringing in money. They don't bring in a ton of money, but they do end up covering some of the costs that may be associated with right sizing. Municipalities. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Walpole. I think they have such great resources if you've been on the Walpole site. So th this came directly from the site, gives you directions on you know clothes, rags, and shoes. Tires, I thought this was fascinating that you can donate tires to the mosquito control department. Not sure why, but you can. Um, televisions and computer monitors, that's a really great resource to drop those off at. You can, some, Best Buy will take some, but they won't take them if they're really old. But you can find online um, the monthly drop off, where you drop them off and when, what specific days, and then Recycling cell phones and, and mercury thermometers, those kinds of things are also available. So you, the, the town site is probably one of the best resources that you have because you also have the opportunity to get rid of um, large items. So find out, do I, you have to get a sticker to get rid of that dresser or that mattress or box spring, pay $25 or whatever to put it out in the street on trash day. So that's also a great resource to get away, to, to get rid of things. The thing that's interesting is you put it out in the street with a sticker on it for trash pickup, you pay $25 for it and someone's come by and take it. They, they probably, they needed it, so I guess that's fine. And the hazardous waste day, I found online that it's May 6th at the Fisher School. So that's gonna be um, paint, oil paint, not latex paint, oil paint, thinners, um, cleaning, um, like updoor cleaning things, you know, the stuff that we use to clean the algae off our homes. Um, latex paint goes in your regular trash. So you let it dry out, take the cover off, let it dry out, throw some kitty litter in it, and then you can throw it in your regular trash. But there's no charge to drop it off at the hazardous waste day at Fisher School, which I think is great. There are so many donation centers around um, and I'm thinking about, you know, S Savers, Salvation Army, Goodwill, um, those that are really well known. Um, some, like Savers benefits the Ep Epilepsy Foundation. I think it's great because it's a very convenient drop-off. So it's really easy when you have that box that you've filled with a few things just to throw it in your car and then drop by Savers and they'll even take it out of the car for you. And they may even take small furniture and that kind of stuff. Um, Salvation Army, the same way, uh, same thing in Goodwill. I love Goodwill because they use their, um, their, their uh, donations to train 
to train staff. And some Goodwill still have a relationship with Dell computers, so they will take old Dell computers, so you'd want to check. So wherever you decide to bring things for donation, you always want to call them and make sure that they'll take it because you don't want to bring it and have them have find out that they don't. And oftentimes on websites, they'll include what they take. And you also, if you have big things, they may have a um, service to pick it up. Yes? Vietnam veterans, they'll pick up at the house. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we're going to talk about that. That's a great online resource. Um, um, Nina was saying that the Vietnam veterans. So donationtown.org, if you put in your zip code, it will give you all of the places that will come by and pick things up. And the thing that I love about that is you have to schedule a time. And if you schedule Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, you know that Monday, that weekend and Monday, you're going to be getting ready for that and it puts you on a schedule. Um, during the pandemic, that really reduced the number of people, that number of organizations that were picking things up. But there are a, little, there are a few, uh, few more there now, but it's really a great resource. Oh, great. Oh, that's great. Um, yes, is that... Um, New life. We were just in, we we have a new um, we have a new team member from Walpole who just made an introduction to new life for us. Yeah, great. Right. That's awesome. So, so the study was saying that um, they will take smaller furniture. They're not going to take large items, but I would imagine small tables, coffee tables. Oh, and this gentleman brought a six-foot couch and they took it. So I guess it, I guess it depends. It may be, and that's why it's important to call and ask because they may need sofas, right? So, yeah. Yeah, bed frames are tough, especially full bed, full size bed frames. But it's really great to check out local organizations that help, um, you know, those in need, um, and it's a great way to give give things a new life. Online resources, you know, Facebook and Craigslist. It's sometimes not worth the effort if you decide if you are Craig, if Facebook savvy, and you decide you want to sell something. Please never be by yourself at the house. Um, and it's it, honestly, it's not worth the effort. You put something for fifty dollars. When they come to pick it up, they offer you twenty. It's just not worth the the aggravation. And then disposal companies. <clears throat> there are so many great ones, and there are so many local ones. We much prefer the local or the smaller disposal companies, not the um, the larger ones that you see advertised on TV, because some of those larger ones will take your items and sell them. So you want to stay with the smaller ones that you know will deliver those things and drop them off for donation. And then finally, I want to make sure that you understand that you can write a lot of your donations off. So visit the IRS website, and there's a specific publication, 561. I guess it changes every couple of years. That tells you what you can write off. The Salvation Army has an IRS-approved list of value, things of value, so you can search on that site. How much is it? You know, how much is a box of clothing? How much is an end table? And you would write that. How much you can, you know, you can write off um, that. So really great resources, and you should be taking advantage of taking advantage of those. Oop, sorry, we're taking a photo. No, I think I may have gone too far. Oftentimes, clients obviously would like to earn every dollar for the sale of items if possible, but we see so frequently that your tax incentive is much greater. So if you could maybe sell your couch for $25 or $50 online, but the IRS says that you can have up to $500 for that couch donation, it's pretty staggering how quickly this all adds up. So make sure you keep your receipts and make your CPA work for you, hand them this form, and they can add it all up. But don't negate the major tax implications here. And I also just wanted to say, it may be obvious, but it's a lot of work. So please know this is what we're here for. This is what we do. 
we coordinate with the town pickup day or the donation companies, or we're happy, just give us a call. It's no charge for us to give you our resources. So like Joe said, take pictures. We're happy to give you copies of our right sizing guide, which includes all of this information, or just pick up the phone and call anytime. We are going to have a sign up sheet if anybody wants a complimentary consultation or just to sign up for our information and resources, please don't hesitate. Um, to put your information down. We just always say this doesn't have to be so hard. It's what we do all day, every day. So please make sure to tap into us whenever needed. But that tax piece is so important not to minimize. Thank you, yes. I have, I have a friend in California that has a small house and I love them. So I said, how do you do this? He worked for Disney for 20 years. He's a sculptor, <clears throat> excuse me. He said, stay in a room. <clears throat> look at everything in that room, pick one thing you can take with you. I stood in my TV room, which is small, and there were 35 things I couldn't get rid of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. But, yeah. But, but start with the ones you can get rid of. And in our right-sizing guide, we do say you can take it room by room, and you'd be surprised the littlest things that you can do in a room will make the room feel less noisy, right? had a for sale sign out, out front. Antique dealers knocked at her door and uh, wanted to know if she had anything that they, would, they wanted to uh, you know, sell to them. Yeah, and I think, that's, I think that's great. And if that happens, just make sure you're not by yourself. <laughs> and know the value, absolutely, yes. You, you can, and we, we've had clients who got scammed on Facebook. That's why it's important to have an appraiser and know who you're selling the items to. Yeah. You know, I think part of, part of our responsibility as, as certified senior and specialty move managers is that we owe an ethical responsibility, we have an ethical and fiduciary responsibility to our clients, whoever we work with, to ensure that they get top dollar. So uh, auctioneers are tough because, remember, they're going to come in and say, I'll give you 40000 for all of this when they know one thing is going to sell for twenty, right? So that's why it's so important to understand what your stuff is worth. And yet there are a lot of great auctioneers, but a lot of them will try especially with older adults, will try to just get everything for nothing. And no, but, does it, but it doesn't matter. They also, know, they also know that you are going through the process and you want to get rid of it. So you're motivated, right? So it's really easy to be taken advantage of. And, you know, online, it's so easy to get taken advantage of. You're trying to sell stuff. That's why I say it's not worth, not worth the problem. Yes? I'm from the uh, Medfield Council on Aging, and the last Saturday in April, we're having a huge yearly yard sale. We'll love to have your stuff. I, 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 information is on our website. Any, any services for pickup? Uh, Billy, no, but we'll be okay. Oh, that's awesome. Anyone see that? Uh, Medfield's having a giant yard sale? Council of Aging, Council of aging in Medfield? Nina just said, what do you do with all of your china? No one wants it. Use it every day. You're good china. Literally use it. The, um, the donation, well, you can. It'll start to fray, but if you're going to donate it anyway. Use it and enjoy it. That is something I will tell you that we see a lot at Household Goods in Acton. Do you know how appreciative people are? They think they're getting broken dishes, and they come in, and they leave with beautiful china sets the level of appreciation. And some China does have resale value. So we're not making a blanket statement. That's why sometimes having the complimentary consultation to have some expert eyes on what you have is important. We have people that get paid to go to all those places and all that stuff. 
Yes. Yeah, so there's a variety of attendees at estate sales that will come. Some are stagers where they're coming to purchase items to stage homes. The thing is the buyers of homes now, these homes are being staged to appeal to a younger buyer. So your belongings are not always the, although Joe showed a picture a few slides back one style of furniture that is selling like hotcakes for top, top, top dollar, mid-century modern furniture. If any of you have furniture from the 50s and 60s, that really clean line, mid-century modern, it is very popular right now and selling for top dollar. So the French provincial, darker furniture, not so much. But that's why it's very important to have consultations with experts because it's really tailored individually per situation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like to, to Aaron's point, there's a, um, a a store in Waltham called Rambles, and they specialize in mid-century modern. Yes. Uh, do you have any suggestions for tools? I have cases of my husband's tools. Yes. So. Um, Habitat for Humanity is a really great organization for tools. I would, I would check also with your, if, is there a local vocational school? Yes. Yep. I, so I would check with their, with them, because there are maybe graduating seniors. Um, my sister, my brother-in-law was a, a mechanic for the MBTA and had I don't know three of those red craftsman tool sets, and she, and she donated them to a student who came and got them. To get something for them, I could donate some, but I, you know, I really can't afford to donate all. Some, yeah, some of it's tough because they can buy, you know, they can buy newer, so you're probably not going to get a lot. But if you donate it to the school for them to donate to a student, you can write it off because it's a nonprofit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So tools are a really big thing. We have. A, a guy who does take a look at tools. He he likes old vintage tools. Um, he likes really the old the old stuff. But the typical wrench set, socket wrench set, all that kind of stuff is, it's still being used, right? So we find that giving them to students to vocational schools is really a good option. Yeah, Royal Dalton and Yadro and all of that is is uh, yeah, yeah. Yadro is not. It does not have a resale value. We, in that estate that we're working on now, um, she must have had I gotta say 150 um, Waterford glasses that she paid 90 dollars for back in the 70s and 80s. They were sold for 10 dollars each. So, I mean, it, there's just not a market. You go online to try to, like, replacements.com is a huge China and crystal reseller. First of all, it costs a fortune to get it to them. And if it chips on the way, you have to pay to have it be sent back. So it's just, it, it's not worth, like I said, it's not worth the effort. Yes? We have a, bu we have a buyer for Hummels. You don't get a lot for Hummels, but we do have a buyer for Hummels. Cups and saucers, um, Lauren, uh, dovetail co-owner with, with Aaron, was telling me yesterday that um, there's an organization on the Cape, I forget its name, that uses old cups and saucers and uses them for flowers and donates them to nursing homes and hospitals. It's, it's in Dennis. Yeah, that's like one of the wedding dresses. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wedding, wedding dresses, there's an organization, a couple of them, where you can donate an old wedding dress for um, stillborn babies for christening and burial gowns. Oh, I have my, my godfather's, because he'd be a hundred and something, um, baptismal dress. What do I do with it? Well, the thing is, you probably can organize, we probably, you can, well, it's probably not, well, yeah, you can, or, you can donate it. The thing that's interesting about the bridal gown thing for donation is that there is a waiting list for donation. They will take them. It's unfortunate that they have to make them, but they will take them, but you have to get on a waiting list. Would they, take that? Yeah. they probably would take that because they don't have to make they don't have to do anything with it. They can just be donated. Yeah. So once you've gone through all of this, what do you do? How do you maintain it? 
right? Either you just you stay in your home, you move, you go on a six month cycle, you know, go back and say, oh, did I did I paint? Did I have that you know family room painted? That den painted? Now did I I have that? Keep that? Get rid of the old paint, right? So start getting rid of this stuff and start back off back with the non emotional to the emotional stuff. Thoughtful shopping and limit buying in bulk. Don't go into the store thinking, ah, oh, grab that, grab that, right? And buying in bulk, we had a client who bought cereal in bulk and had didn't have enough space for the cereal in the kitchen but had ru those Rubbermaid closets in the basement and those boxes that come with two, pa two bags in each box. There was so much outdated cereal and it was just taking up a ton of space. Paper towels, like who needs 15, paper, 15 rolls of paper towels? You know, if you have space for it, I say yes, do it. I but do, but I have four small children. We have a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. One thing in, one thing out. You pick it up and you say, why do I have it? I just bought something that's just like it. You know, get rid of it. You buy two new pillows, throw them in your, the old ones in your donation box. And then finally, touch it once. If you go home today in the kitchen cabinet, top shelf, pull down that tumbler or something that someone gave you that's up there, touch it once and start your collection of donations to drop off at Savers. So as Aaron said, you can request through the sign-up sheet or right-sizing at dovetailcompanies.com and you can get our, um, our right-sizing guide that includes all of this information. And, any, and my number is there. Uh, if you want to call for a specific uh, with specific questions, any? how many of you are thinking about staying home and right sizing at home? Show of hands. How many of you are thinking about right sizing to a smaller space or a different location from home? Okay. Um, it seems very different, but it's very similar to Joe's point. It's the. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same same process. So know that wherever you are in the process, for those of you that raised your hand, you're thinking about going elsewhere, that is a big area of our expertise. It's also complimentary if you ever just wanna talk through what are the other options besides leaving the long time, staying in the long time home, because sometimes it's so overwhelming, there's so many options out there, you don't know where to begin, and we'd be happy to be a resource for that as well. We can't thank you all enough for being here with us. I think we're in Medfield coming up too. Yeah. I can't make that one. That's why. Okay, well thank you for joining. Thank you.